Welcome to the Round 6 Podcast, a weekly roundtable discussion featuring a variety of automotive subjects, interviews, special guests, and stories, hosted by the Round 6 Gearheads, Brian Stupski, Brad King, Eric Hibbs, Alex Welsh, and Del Swanson. We welcome you back to part two of our very special masterclass with automotive artist Tom Fritz. As a kid developing, when I would go to the races, I was kind of the goofball. I was the nerd. I was the dork. Um, the spaz, you know. And the reason was, when I got out of the races and we were all driving home in the station wagon, and, and of course everybody is, is relating to everyone else what was the coolest thing about the night. Well, it was when Ron Hornaday passed Jimmy Insulo on the on the, the fourth corner, you know. Names and numbers and times and and Tom, what did you think was cool? Well, I thought it was cool when, when the uh, on the back stretch there at night when the radiator hose busted, up and suddenly the the track was full of steam, and as the car was driving down, you know the, the cockpit filled with steam and was flagging out the back of the car. That was cool. <laughs> or I loved the way that the uh, you know the the overrun would come out the exhaust pipe. When the car pulled into the uh, the third corner, and re- and the, the driver took his foot off the gas, you know, you get the, uh, the blue flames and the burbling and the you know that is cool, and that was what I I thought at the drag races, I I thought the coolest job would be the photographer, but I wanted to be the guy that jumped over the wall and laid down on the track as the car went by, um, so I I. I can look back and I, I knew that I was very visual and emotionally oriented. Um, the facts, figures, numbers, uh, all that stuff, you know, that didn't jive with me. And, and so I put that in my paintings today. I, I still do. It's, you know, if you look at the viewpoint, the point of view of my paintings where I'm placing, you know, you as a viewer in my work, that's where I want to be. Um, uh, the lighting was always critical to me. I love dramatic lighting, and the, the drama of lighting just adds to the drama of the subject. Um, mm-hmm. Now, when you look at the the quiet moments, you know the guy is standing around an old an old hot rod or old an old bike. The I am drawing on my personal experiences in the seventies. I mean, in high school, in the parking lot you know, outside of the arcade or outside of McDonald's after the football game or whatever, you know, the human interactions that revolve around vehicles are universal and timeless. Um, And so I I put those in, I just, I just uh, transfer them into the the paintings. Um, The, uh, uh, I'm usually telling a story with my work. Um, uh, yeah, so this is, this is kind of how it all comes together for me. Um, oh, you mentioned, uh, we get into the sixties. I would like to do some more sixties cars, uh, but suddenly we get into the show car stuff and, um, and I can appreciate it and I love it. However, another important factor for us artists is making a living doing what we're doing. And I hate to sound like uh, so cut and dry here, but if you make a specific car, suddenly mm-hmm. your painting becomes very uh, um, oh, volatile, volatile. Right. It doesn't have a broad appeal. It, you know, uh, uh, an over it, it. Some people will like it. Maybe fewer than more will like it, or someone won't like it because oh, I saw this, and you know, 
Um, and I have to make a living doing this. I have to sell that painting. Right. And so I kind of target my market to, you know, the more um, broadly accepted um, imagery. Um, I, I just don't want to wind up one day with a stack of paintings, you know, that I'm just going to pile up in the backyard and, and torch because I, I can't get rid of them. Yeah. Uh, so that's that's part of the reality of it. I in the motorcycles, I love the the uh, the choppers that were in the valley in the San Fernando Valley in the uh, um, late '60s, early '70s. I love that early stuff, and it was everywhere back then for me. Um, the we had the San Fernando uh, uh, drag strip out in Silmar, over, over in San Fernando area. And I remember uh, watching the dragsters being towed down to uh, San Fernando, going down Devonshire Street, Chatsworth Street, where I lived, and watching them go by. And this was in the days when paint was white and the cars were incredibly raw. And that is kind of my era for, for the drag racing, was um, when it was small and raw and everybody could get into it. Um, mm -hmm. uh, I, I love that kind of appeal. Once for me, once the, uh, the money got behind it and it became commercial, um, it kind of, you know, the imagery for me kind of dies. Um, yeah. but that's, it, that's personal for me and, um, I can paint it, but, uh, um, no, I think that has broad appeal, actually. Another thing that happened was uh, when I first started painting, there were there was a lot of artists, and there still are today. They're they're painting the uh, the the, uh, the subject matter, and as artists, we all we all need our reference, especially when you're painting historical objects. Um, you need to work from reference, and there's a lot of photographs out there. And when you work from old photographs, there are copyright issues. You have to yeah. research who owns that copyright, uh, get a clearance or a license from them. Mm -hmm. um, and that's very difficult. And that throws uh, cold water on a fire. If you're, uh, you, you know, you got your, your, you're all set to start painting something, you know, that, right. that'll certainly kill it for you. So I have to go out and, and do a lot of my own photography and dig up the cars. And a lot of times backward, backwards engineer what I'm looking at because things have changed, you know, uh, wheel tire combinations, um, uh, how you start um, uh, an old Hemi engine, you know, in the days before the, the electric starters, when you mm -hmm. bump start, there's a different look to the front of the engine that, that uh, right. mm -hmm. uh, so I have to take all that into consideration when I'm doing my paintings. Uh, like I was saying, the old choppers, I've, I've gotten into that, but, and there's an incredible uh, emotional impact to those kind of paintings. But once again, I have to consider my market. You know, I've had, yeah. I've had some people buy some originals from me and they, they love them because of the emotion that I put in the painting, but they're, they're a difficult sell because of the subject. Um, the bikes but, are? Especially the, uh, the choppers. Really? Yeah. And the, uh, the old gang stuff, you know, the, uh, um, you gotta be really careful if you're painting, uh, cuts with the, uh, colors on them and stuff. Oh yeah. All right. Yeah. So it's, you know, and those are issues for at least this artist. Um, mm -hmm. but you know, so, Tom, are you doing more like just personal projects at this point, or are you doing much commission work, or how do you how, how do you schedule your your time? I consider commissions. Um, I turn them down because I don't uh, I don't like where the commission's going or the subject matter, or uh, it, it's not fulfilling to me. Or if I feel that I'm going to be uh, a risk for someone. Um, I don't, I don't handle those. Um, I will redirect if someone's 
you know, I'll, I'll pass the name along to another artist or suggest another artist if I feel that, that uh, it would be better handled by them. Um, uh, so, and I have, I have a couple right now that are on the clipboard, but I'm doing basically mostly what I want to do. I feel I'm, I'm strongest there. Um, the results are better. Um, you know, it's just, it, it's more fun. Mm -hmm. And, and another thing about commission work is you are, it's kind of sometimes like swimming upstream because you have expectations that you're working towards. Uh, a commission is a collaboration between the artist and the commissioning body. Um, and they have their, what they envision. And certainly you have what you would like to pull out of the uh, painting. And so there has to be a happy medium there. Right. And sometimes that, that can get in the way. Um, uh, you know, but yeah, so I do, I do, uh, consider commission work. Interesting. But speaking Very of cool. commissions, you know, and your work, what, uh, what is a, a, a typical uh, time commitment on, on a painting? Just to, you know, I, I, um, I know it, it uh, depends on the size and all that kind of stuff, but, but what's a typical, um, a painting as far as, as far as uh, your time commitment goes? Well, um, at the bottom end, I guess it would be uh, when I do the Barrett Jackson auction in Scottsdale in uh, January, I'll normally work on three paintings in the booth and they are roughly in the uh, 16 by 20 size. Mm -hmm. And sometimes in, uh, one year I finished all three there. Sometimes I'll get two completed. Sometimes uh, you get pretty darn close, but they need, you know, a couple of uh, sessions in the studio to really, mm -hmm. you know, uh, finalize. But people get to see me working there, and so I'm there for ten days. And if those three paintings get done in those ten, or get that close in ten days. Okay. Um, and that is in between talking to people and you know uh, the day in day out business. Yeah. If I'm down here in the studio, depending on the size. Most of my paintings take me about uh, a week and a half to two weeks. If they okay. take any longer than that, they, they start to turn into cottage cheese. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, you know, that, that's about how they go. I like to work direct. Um, I work best start to finish on a painting. Um, I normally don't have two or three, uh, you know, uh, or one leaning up against the wall, face yeah. to the wall, so I don't have to look at it for a while. I usually work pretty direct, and that okay. that is kind of a uh, that is kind of a result of being a commercial artist with uh, deadlines all the time. Sure, you know, uh, just take completion and then moving on to the next one. Okay, I got goes that kind of pinpoints my problem with cars is. You know, when I'm building a car, if I if I work on more than one at a time, nothing gets done. Yeah. <laughs> so if I just turn all my focus to one vehicle, which I really need to do to get something done, um, yeah, I'm a lot more effective. It's it's funny. A lot of the uh, you know the, the same uh, situation that builders have in their day in and day out. I can sit down and talk with them, and you can almost uh, cross. In, you know, uh, connect with them. What happens in a studio is happening in their garage too. You know, right? Um, same kind of mentality, I guess. But uh, yeah, you know, it's it's all good. Very cool. So, a while back, when uh, you and I were, I think we were at uh, SEMA. It was probably been two or three years. I had asked about how you got this gig with the stamps mm -hmm. for the post office. I thought that was kind of a neat story. Would you share it with us? I hope it's the same story. <laughs> yeah, <Well>. me too. <laughs> 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 Older you get, the better you were, right? <laughs> <laughs> well, um, the way it came down, uh, I, I get asked this a lot. Um, I didn't know it at the time. What what happened was I was sitting here at the studio one day working away and the phone rings and I picked it up and it's somebody from the U.S. Postal Service and, hey, would you be interested in doing a series of stamps? 
well, what's your answer going to be? <laughs> you know, um, and I said, yeah, let's do this. You know, I was, you know, wow. The next question is, you know, how did this come about? Um, there was a series of stamps that was started, uh, um, maybe about maybe ten years ago now. And Art Fitzpatrick, who is the uh, sure. he he was one of the the grandmasters. I mean, the gentleman he recently passed here within the last year or two ago. He and, for Pontiac, didn't he? Yes, he did the, the uh, he and and Van uh, Van Kaufman did the uh, wide track Pontiac ads in the 60s. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And Art was a young man, a designer, an illustrator, back in the 30s. And uh, he was the gentleman that that penned the uh, the Packard Darren. Um, oh, yeah. I'm going to say it was the 38. So he had some history behind him. And... And so I knew of Art Fitzpatrick, and when I was uh, a boy, uh, I go up to my grandma's house, grand my grandparents' house up there in Tahunga, and uh, while well, grandparents were talking to my parents, and it was a boring conversation, I would be going through the the magazines that my grandmother had on the uh, you know laying out on the floor there, and she let me tear out the. Uh, AFBK ads for Pontiac because I loved the cars and the way they were rendered. Um, so I was collecting all of his art when I was a boy. <laughs> and fast forward, um, I met Art because he became, he was invited to become a member of the Automotive Fine Arts Society, uh, of which I'm a member. Uh, this would have been maybe 10 years ago or so. And uh, I met him at the uh, uh, AFAS um, premiere exhibition up there at Pebble Beach at the uh, Concord Elegance in, I'm going to say it was 2002, 2003, somewhere in that range. Um, and he appreciated my work and was very complimentary of it. And he and I became uh, good buddies over the years. Um, it, it, you know, for me, it was one of those pinch myself moments, you know, <laughs> yeah. yeah, because of the, the, uh, the weight this man had in, in, in the, uh, the world automotive culture. Well, the post office had a series of stamps and art created them and it was called, Oh, I'm going to say it was the, uh, fins of the fifties. Yeah. I think that, yeah, okay. that sounds right. Yeah. yeah. The post office came up with a series called, uh, um, America in Motion or something and and so the first set of stamps were the uh, um, fins of the 50s and say and then there was a second series that Art worked on and it was oh gosh I'm, I'm drawing a blank here but I'm going to say it was fabulous fabulous 50s or fabulous it was something like that but there's a second set of stamps that Art did well, the third set of stamps was coming up, and the post office got a hold of Art and said, hey, you want to do these? And by now, Art was feeling his years, and he he said he, he didn't have it in him to do another set of stamps. So the post office uh, said, well, you know, is there anybody you can recommend? And so Art gave him a list. And this is all my understanding. It can probably be a... Uh, uh, or corrected somewhere along the line, but he gave him a list. And I guess I was on the list. And the the way the post office works, to my understanding, is that they at that time they had fifteen or twenty art directors working in the stamp uh, um, business. And these art directors, uh, if if you looked at them, these were you know some pretty highfalutin folks. Um, a lot of them worked for ad agencies. Uh, uh, you know, I did a little bit of research and I was really impressed with who the art directors were. And of course, I've been following the uh, postage stamp series since, you know, gosh, when I was a kid. And and some of the, uh, the illustrators that they had working for them over the years were 
just outstanding. <clears throat> well, um, as it went down, uh, apparently they also did a quick search on who was doing what in automotive art, and um, they came down, and I guess I was the first choice. And so they called me up, and that's how I kind of landed it. I said, yeah, I'd do it. I met my art director, and he and I got together and uh, um, uh, went out and gathered reference, and off I was going. That's how it came down. Um, but, yeah, that's, that's how it worked. It wasn't, you know, there, there was no lottery. Um, I didn't have to submit a portfolio. Uh, I well, if, I rec if I recall, that list of artists was quite distinguished. So, you know, and uh, obviously they made a great choice. Well, it was it, it was at, at Art Fitzpatrick's uh, recommendation. And yeah. so I was up there. It, it must have been a short list. I, I, <laughs> I recall hearing the names. I can't recall. You know, it, it's it's been uh, eight years or, or so since I was first contacted. So it's a little fuzzy in my brain and I don't want to be incorrect. Yeah in my uh, uh, reflections here. I'm going through pretty, right. pretty cool when one of your heroes recommends you for the job. That's a pretty cool deal. Yeah. I'm oh, I was go out on a limb here and say that Robert Maplethorpe was not one of the artists. <laughs> <laughs> Probably not. Okay. okay. <laughs> I just thought, okay, because, yeah, well, you know, never mind. This, this bullwhip <laughs> series always sticks in my head. So go ahead. Oh. Sorry. <laughs> For our listeners, if you Google that, um, don't do it at work. <laughs> Sorry to interrupt. Jeez. But the the uh, that that project was really it was incredible. It was fun. Um, it, it was it, it was kind of it was it, it went back to my commercial days. I mean, it was a it was a commercial project. Um, uh, however, they uh, I had to submit some comps, uh, some sketches. And it was really neat was that I guess because they, uh, Carl, who was my art director, knew uh, what my work was. They saw my sketches, and I went pretty much direct to um, uh, to panel, to canvas with the paint. Uh, and there were no, um, there, was ver there were very few corrections or, you know, adjustments to my paintings. I, th I remember one of them was the back of the... Uh, the uh, um, charger. The uh, when I painted it, there was no license plate, and of all the cars, it was the one license plate because you were looking at the rear of the car, and it was it was right there, dead center. And my question to them, when they said there's no license plate, and um, I remember I answered them. I said, well. There wouldn't be one if you just stole it off the lot. And they, <laughs> they, they, they had their chuckle and going, well, no, really, seriously, Tom. And I said, well, the, my next question is, which plate would you like? There's 50 of them. Sure. And <laughs> so they said, well, make it your choice. So California, you know. Okay, of course. Black and yellow. And uh, of course that, uh, wasn't that a Daytona? And it still had uh, to be a California plate, right? Yeah. Yep. <laughs> and, and, and it, it worked out good. And I had to Greek everything. You can't, you don't, you don't want a license plate that you can make out and, you know, turns yeah. belong to a, an old truck somewhere, but, um, <laughs> yeah, everything could be Greek. And the other, let's see, was there another situation? Oh, there was a, the reference car for the, uh, the Hamikuda didn't have the, the, uh, the, the rocker plate on it. They had all the gills, the, uh, louvers on the rock. Um, panel down on below the door and that had to be adjusted too. But I think it was pretty much, Oh, um, the other thing that was, that came up was the, uh, the uh, Chevelle. If you look at the Chevelle stamp, a woman is driving it female. And that was, they wanted a, one of the cars had to be a uh, convertible. Mm -hmm. And so they, so we all, agreed that the Chevelle would be the convertible. And the other thing was, uh, uh, I said, when there's when the car is a convertible, I said, you've just entered another situation here that has to be addressed. I said, you're going to be able to see the driver. And my next question is, 
male, female, and uh, you know the, uh, the the race of the driver. Mm-hmm. And that opens up a can of worms. It just you know, mm-hmm. if you look, the the driver is placed behind the uh, the A pillar. So you, that. <laughs> Nicely done. Yeah. Um, I was going to say, if, if you had asked me, if you just been like, I need a race, gender, et cetera, I'd have just gone, yes. <laughs> Let's see the yeah, answer I get on any race. brief. What, what, what color should it, it be? Yes. It, exactly. It becomes one of those questions that cannot be answered. And, and uh, you know, so you, you try to strike that happy medium. And, and uh, I did what. I would do as an as an illustrator, and it comes in your training is you have to you're approached with those problems all the time, and you have to mm-hmm. you have to solve them. How come you got a clown driving the car? <laughs> <laughs> so did so did you paint in all the uh, all the door dings and everything, and all the <laughs> Dan, Dan Fay Baker tribute stamp? Yeah. Yeah. Awesome. <laughs> Purse sliding across the hood. <laughs> <laughs> garbage flying around inside this would be great <laughs> it is a convertible yeah it was a, it was a fun project you know it was all yeah. curbed oh, sorry <laughs> but no it was it was it was a good project and and incredibly honored to have done it and uh um uh, yeah the whole the way the whole thing came down um just you know again another one of those pinch me moments oh yeah yeah it's great to have that you know you know they wrap portfolio and now I got a question. How big did they did they have you paint those or did you paint them to scale? <laughs> <laughs> Painted every one of them on the stamp. <laughs> on the have a needle, they blew them up for the stamps. <laughs> <laughs> this is where this is where, you know, for me, working commercially for all those years, um, it was a no brainer. I'm working uh, what's my final product gonna be? It's gonna be a half an inch wide by you know whatever it is so it's very small so right i said okay i just i held my hands up i said a 10 inch by 18 inch painting is the same uh height to width aspect ratio as that postage stamp and that's the size you know after you've done them for so long you know you can hold your arms three feet out by four feet high that's what you need no this one here is 10 by 18 that'll give me with the way that i work uh when you drop it down Everything tightens up, mm-hmm. and that meant that I can do a painting that would tighten up so much that painting any larger, I'd be putting in details that would not be readable at that reduced size. So you, you just know what what works for how you work and and scale, and that's you know that, that's the size of the paintings. They were ten by eighteen. They were painted on a masonite panel. Um, and the way that the post office explained it to me in in easy terms, so I could understand it, no artist signs the the face of the painting. Um, so I signed the the back of the panels, and the reason for that is because they said it was pretty darn close. It's not the same thing, but it's pretty darn close to American currency, and the artist that that designs the uh, dollar bill doesn't sign his name to it, you know. Okay. So, I would have. I would have. Yeah, <laughs> I, I Andrew Jackson. Have hidden that in I, there, or at least I some. always. Yeah, I I'd, always hide my hide my name in stuff that that uh, <laughs> that uh, I'm, I'm not supposed to sign. Well, Del, yeah. Del, you you know how what I like to hide in all of my work. That just wouldn't work <laughs> on a postage stamp. So, no, well, no, no, no. I, I got another question, Tom. Where did the uh, where did the originals end up at? They are now in the National Postal Museum at the Smithsonian Institute. Outstanding. Oh, wow. Okay. I'm uh, planning a trip there with my son, cool. so this is going to be right there. You gave me the first thing to beeline for. That, That's you cool. know, again, another uh, pinch me situation for me. It's a um, it's pretty small company in that, that uh, you know, when I consider that those paintings are, are – you know, I don't know where they're at. Probably in a in a uh, drawer somewhere. But you know, they're the other artists that are in there that have done the stamps too. It's like wow, that's you know, it's just an incredible honor. It just keeps mm-hmm. it just keeps going on and on. But uh, um, 
no, it's just, you know, that, that's where they're at right now. Okay. That's cool. So, so with your paintings, is that how you work on, on Masonite usually? Uh, yeah, well, it, 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 Dell, it's, 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 it's like, uh, the, the painting tells me what it's going to be on. Okay. You understand that? Um, yeah. I, I do paint on canvas a lot. Um, I don't normally paint on a, uh, a 24 by 36 or a 20 by 30 or a 24 by 24. The, the painting to me, I've gotten to a point now where my, my paintings, the aspect ratio is, is, uh, mandated by the image. Okay. Um, and the, uh, and like I said, the, uh, the substrate that I'm working on is also, you know, the, when I paint on masonite, the paint slides off my brush differently than it does on my canvas. Yeah. And that has a direct link to the image that I'm anticipating at the far end of this, you know, so, uh, sometimes I want a slipperier feel on the, uh, the brush and I'll work on the masonite or sometimes I'll work on uh, the canvas because I want a certain, um, quality to the paint application. You know, the canvas drags the paint off the brush, mm -hmm. uh, differently. And, and that's what I'm looking for. So I'll paint on canvas. And a bit more texture. A little bit of texture. However you want to. There's also the feel, um, the masonite or, or the door skin that I work on, um, it's harder and the paintbrush has a different feel when you poke that canvas, um, or you, it's harder on the brush. And when you poke on a canvas, the way I stretch my canvases, I like them like uh, drum tight. There's a, a slight shock absorption to it. You know, it, it gives a little bit. So that has a different feel, too. Um, and in some places where my brushwork becomes more of a staccato, you know, machine gun kind of application, that that balance in the canvas kind of it helps me. It works better for me. Okay. It's, yeah, it's a feel thing. Well. Not not to give away any secrets whatsoever. I mean, if you're if you're pulling a Salvador Dali and making your own, you know, mediums by like squeezing a weasel into a uh, a <laughs> carton of orange juice or something like that, is there? Do you use any particular medium with your work, or do you do you have like is there like a set Tom Fritz sort of um, a, a method for that as far as using mediums or anything like that additives? No, that. Um... I worked commercially for too long and you know, um, about working commercially, you got to get the job done. You got to get it out. You know, it's got to be finished, dried and, and out the door. And that's carried over into my work. Uh, I could grind my own pigments, but dang it, you know, um, the art supply stores have so much of it and it's ready to go. I just have something there. Um, the same thing. I, there are so many different kinds of mediums and, and they all have their special blends, and and I've read about them, and I used to mix them at the start, and it's just an additional process that, to me, doesn't it, it actually gets in the way and hinders the uh, the the spirit of my work. That you know, I want to get it done. I want to I want to enjoy the, the the act, and sitting there mixing and measuring, and you know, Ugh. I don't do that. So I uh, liquid is my great, you know. I, Liquin has even changed now. I, I go for the old original liquin uh, medium. It it uh, uh, dries pretty quick. Sometimes I'll just use the uh, uh, mineral spirits with my oil oil paints. Um, depending on how thick you want it, that your paint, uh, the mineral spirits. If you're putting it on a on a uh, um, a white house primer, it, it sucks up pretty darn quick and it dries in in uh, you know couple hours it's ready to go Very nice. uh, so there's you know it's it's just it's how you want to work how you want to get it down um uh, sometimes i'll use a secative dryer or a uh, uh japan dryer if i'm looking for something to, to uh dry quicker but then you have other issues cracking and stuff that happens if you if you put too much of that in you have to kind of know all that um <laughs> here i am looking at your your picture on the 
Skype deal. <laughs> trying to maintain my sanity. <laughs> <laughs> the, the medium that Dell has chosen is um, not hair drill. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, uh, um, copal, copal medium is another one that uh, sometimes, you know, I'll take a, I'll take a, uh, the cap off the copal medium and I'll dip a, uh, a uh, palette knife into it and put two or three drops of it into my uh, white. You know, I, I squeeze out a big blob of white on the, on the palette and I'll just chop it in there and that makes the white, which goes into almost every color, anyways. You know, it helps dry the paint faster too. I can get a, I can get my paints to kick in about six hours if I really wanted to. Wow. So, yeah, and, you know, so it's all kind of like when you when you painted for miles and miles and miles, you kind of know what you're 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 looking for and how to anticipate it, and you you look at the clock in the wall and you figure, hey, you know, if I'm gonna get some shut eye here. I can uh, put my licks in in the next three hours, and when I wake up, the painting will be ready to work on. You know, uh, so it it's kind of intuitive. Um, you know, you you, you kind of know what you're doing, and it's hard to explain. I understand it as a student because I was there one time too, or as a, a a person new to it. You're trying to absorb all of the mediums and the, you know. What, what do you clean your brushes with? Turpenite or or uh, paint thinner or um, uh, you know all these these secrets and right. and you know, time tested through the centuries. You know uh, how you know do I wash my brushes? No, and the reason I don't wash brushes is because I scrub them down too fast. I paint you know. And brushes to me are, are just part of the process. I don't fall in love with them, you know. Once a brush is gone, it's I chuck it and grab a new one. <laughs> just a tool. It's a tool. It's you know, uh, my thumb is a tool too, and so is a little wad of paper towel. It you know, it whatever works at the time, you know. Uh, right. You know, it's all good. Well, hopefully you don't wear your thumb out and chuck it. Well, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> like Brian does. <laughs> Usually it winds up somewhere else where it shouldn't be, and I get paint somewhere, you know. <laughs> but, Which Brian does as well. Yeah, so, but Brian, Brian, I go all, it's all natural when I'm working, so there's paint everywhere. Um, yeah, I wondered, I always wondered, like, I, I had had so many instructors when I went to school that were, they all had their secret matters. It was like, you have to mix this particular oil with this. It's the only way to make this paint lay out. And I always wondered, I had one who was very big on peanut oil. And to this day, I wonder if any of his paintings have caused like an allergic reaction somewhere. <laughs> <laughs> you know, they, they, they can't be this crap the whole time. I just, you know, I, I remember um, getting these cans of oils and, and you know, mediums and... Um, uh, it's, I've used, I have, to, I have to admit it, but I've used kerosene sometimes in my paintings because to clean my brushes because it's, it's got a different, you know, when the brush is clean in kerosene um, and before you dip into the paint again, it's a little bit oilier and it's got a different feel to it. Oh, I it mean, does. I've, I've done that. I, oh, my gosh. Yeah. I mean, and if you tell people, some people, you know, oh, I just go down to the hardware store and get kerosene. They're looking at you like, what? You're buying, you're buying your stuff and your paintings from a hardware store. Well, yeah, yeah. It, um, it's all about that. It's ex, it's experimentation. I mean, nobody understands. You've got to be one part, you know, color theorist, another part, you know, fine artist, part chemist, and then you know, when you figure out all these things are having a reaction on you, you become kind of a freelance doctor for yourself. You know, you're a physician in your own home, <laughs> diagnosing yeah. what caused that nasty growth on your thumb. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. The, the early days, um, especially back in school, we had to clean our brushes with turpentine, and I love the smell of turpentine. God, you know, I love the smell of oil paints. I love, you know, I just mm -hmm. love the yeah. smell. That's why I work in oils probably most. But uh, 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 acrylics always smell like dirty socks to me or something. Just <laughs> <laughs> but. Um, 
Um, and I always remember that after some studio sessions, especially if you're with other artists and stuff, you, you go back home and your throat is uh, locking up on you because of that turpentine stuff. Yeah. Yeah. I, I just got away from it and I found out that, uh, um, and, and other artists will laugh at me and, and uh, hex me, you know. But just regular paint thinner, you know. It does, it does what I want it to do. It always has. Um, uh, but, but it, you know, that's why I clean my brushes with mostly now. Um, you know, it's, it's a very, very simple process, my painting. I just I made it simple back in the days when... Uh, uh, I was cranking out commercial stuff because it had to be done. It had to be dry. It had, you know, and plus the, there was the old school of thought that if you're working commercially, as long as the paint stayed on the canvas until it was photographed yeah. <laughs> and the check cleared. <laughs> well, next <laughs> one, one other weird question then kind of on that. Um, do you ever do you ever get requested? Uh, say you're doing a um, a commission piece. Do you ever have it requested to do it in a particular medium? I mean, have you ever had someone come to you and say, "I want this painted uh, completely in tempera paint with um, sidewalk chalk and maybe day glow <laughs> window markers"? You sound like my old boss. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's it's the oils. There's a, a, you know, oil paints uh, still um, for, for, for people, for art purchasers, especially in, in, in uh, you know, who I'm dealing with, the oil paints are the, uh, what they're looking for. There's a, um, the colors are, have much more impact. Um, Definitely. And there seems to be that stigma too, where if you were to compare, to me, it always, I don't know, it just always felt that way if you saw an oil painting next to an acrylic. The oil painting seems to have much more of like, I don't know, some kind of an intrinsic quality about it that makes it, I, I don't want to knock anyone on this. It's not what I'm trying to say. It just seems that that would be, I don't know, worth more and have more longevity to it. Yeah. I mean, it's the master's painted in oil. And so you're going to make it as close as you can to something that the masters, you know, something with that value to it. Um, use the best materials available. Acrylics, um, I, I, as a commercial artist, I, I did everything. I, you know, everything from charcoal to dry pastel to acrylics, uh, Prismacolor, you know, ink, everything, uh, markers, um, airbrush. Um, but the, the acrylics to me, have you ever seen an acrylic that's maybe more than 10 years old, 15 years old? The paint is, the paint is kind of sticky and there's a, uh, you know, the atmosphere has settled on the paint and it just, there's a quality to it that it, it needs to be cleaned or something. To my eye, it just looks like, you know, it's like, it looks like the, uh, the, uh, the rafters on my house, you know, um, it just dulls and it, it, yeah, it, look, it looks like your neighbor's car that was painted in the seventies with, you know, lacquer paint and never waxed. It just has that sort of milky. Yeah. Know. It's so if we do have any rafter cleaners listening in Southern California, Tom Fritz is looking for a good referral. <laughs> <laughs> now I have to, now, now, now all my, my stocks in acrylic now are, are worthless. I'm sorry. <laughs> no luck, guys. You know, um, talking about acrylics, you know, Liquitex is like one of the, the, you know, top manufacturers of it. Did you know that, or do you remember when Liquitex made oil paints? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Do you remember? They were incredible. They were gorgeous. I mean, it was, I still have tubes of Liquitex oil paints. And uh, what was it back in the late eighties, early nineties, maybe they stopped and uh, they just went solely to acrylics. And I always wondered why. I have no idea. I yeah. still have a, a few tubes too, I think. And remember the, uh, the, um, all of the Liquitex products. I don't, I, I haven't bought a tube of acrylics in a long time, but remember they were all, um, uh, I want to say that they all had their, uh, 
their standards for the Munsell color chart, you know, where they sat on the Munsell color chart mm -hmm. and the value, the value system that they occupied and all that stuff was on the tube. And it was, that was handy. You know, there, there's a whole, uh, uh, liquid text really, really did pretty well with marketing that, um, uh, that whole system of mixing the colors, uh, uh, per hue, per value, and what you could, you could reasonably, um, expect what your mix was going to make. It was the neatest system. I loved it. And I don't know if they're still doing that now, but, uh, yeah. <laughs> well, listen up Liquitex. We want your oils. <laughs> yeah, really. I... Bring them back. Um, some of the old brush manufacturers that, uh, have left and I guess come back now. Remember, remember the series sevens, Windsor Newtons, mm -hmm. they disappeared. And I guess recently just because of, of everybody screaming, they came back now. I think, uh, I, th I, I'm pretty sure they came back. Um, maybe you guys can correct me on that. No, actually, I believe I did hear that. Yeah. Um, I mean the, the, the red sable, the, the animal that made the, uh, the fur for those brushes was, extinct or, or on, uh, on, uh, it was pretty close to extinction or something like that. So I had to stop making them, but the Clint, Klinsky sable or whatever they call it. Cute. Uh, it sounds delicious. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it was. Uh, no. Oh, sorry. <laughs> I had to start pulling my mustache hairs out to make my brushes. <laughs> I was going to ask you, that was my next question. <laughs> I was going to ask you because uh, just you know, the armaking, my yeah. earlier Dolly references. When, when he says <laughs> that was, was a say, booger of a painting, you don't have any facial hair. <laughs> how are you? Or, you know, how are you so good without having that? You know, the mustache. Right? <laughs> That's what I thought the secret was. So. Well, this is what it looked, looked like before puberty. <laughs> <laughs> oh, there you go. Another reason for someone to visit your site. Yeah. <laughs> if you go back in time and visit Tom pre-puberty, that's. <laughs> That could be a whole blog post. Yeah. <laughs> That's going to be the name of this. <laughs> Tom Fritz before puberty? Tom? <laughs> Pre-puberty Tom <laughs> discusses making... Uh, yeah. Never mind. Paintbrushes from extinct animals. Perfect. That's a long blog post title, but we'll, we'll figure it out. Well, they are making that brush again, so... Cool. Cool. Are they? Yeah. Is it synthetic, or did they are they like Jurassic Parking the whole thing, and one day we're going to be overrun by these sables? That's no, actually it, a very good question. I don't know. They're they're not synthetic. It's I think I think the animal is called a Kalinsky sable, or it's yes, a red sable. Right. It's like a little squirrel kind of animal, a rodent maybe, but it has this gorgeous uh, orange red fur on its tail or something, and they make these brushes out of them. And Windsor Newton makes this number seven sable, um, and it's a, a it's a it's a very very fine brush with a uh, it holds uh, watercolor ink you know really well. And the thing about it is it has this this very responsive flexible tip that can take you from a hairline to a uh, I don't know a three sixteenths inch uh, uh, thickness you know, very smoothly and cleanly. It's, it's, you know, it has a really wonderful response. You know, I purchased a whole bunch of them years ago and still have quite a few left. But I, I when I heard that they were going out, um, I just shook my head. A lot of the old, the good old art supplies are, are disappearing. The, uh, the, uh, the black wing pencils. Uh, it's a pencil that has a, a certain uh, carbon, I guess, graphite that makes this wonderful black and it's incredibly smooth to use and it's most notable for its shape. It's a regular pencil, but when you get to the eraser tip on it, it kind of flattens out and had a, a kind of a flat pink eraser on it. Um, there's, there's a gentleman out there, another artist, Ed Tilrock. Who yeah. Is a, oh yeah. 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 He's, he does, he works in graph graphite a lot does beautiful uh, drawings and he just, you know, he's old school. He's a few years older than me. And he remembers that the pencils were different back then. And he and I 
we talk about the pencils that are missing, the old 314 drafting pencils. I don't think they make those anymore. There were some wonderful go-to pencils that um, you just knew them for the way they handled. And when you've done it enough, you know, there's, there's a hand to using those art supplies. And sadly now they're disappearing. Uh, you pick up a pencil that's made at the, uh, you know, a Ticonderoga, I don't think is made in the United States anymore. You pick it up and it's gravelly and rough and... Well, the wood is plastic also. Oh, yeah. You know, so. they're, you know it, it's, it has just changed. Mm-hmm. And, you know, the old standards are gone. And But what does that mean as an artist is, is we have to evolve and kind of, I guess, accept that and you work within the realm of what you have. And so your work has to, uh, you, you, you got to, you know, you got to swap up. Mm-hmm. There's, there's brushes I used to use 30 years ago that are no longer made. And uh, there are pens that I that are no longer made. And I had to buy the last of the, uh, 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 what are they called, uh, calligraphic pens by Sanford. Okay. They're now made by Sharpie, and Sharpie doesn't make them in certain colors anymore. Hmm. And some of those colors were, were uh, something that I used. So, you know, you know, talking about Ed Tellrock, I, a couple of years ago, I was talking to him and he said that he, he will go to yard sales and, um, uh, estate sales and stuff just to try to find old pencils. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. you, you just, you know, you cannot get a quality pencil for, for illustration anymore. And he, he says, to. you know, he'll buy, you know, 20 or 30 of them wrapped together with a rubber band. And, you know, the people are thinking, oh, who's going to buy these? Mm-hmm. Yeah, Ed will. <laughs> yep. I know he. Has, okay, you just opened up a whole market for that. Yeah, he yeah. has I, some of his collectors, some of his uh, Facebook followers, you know, his fans. Mm-hmm. They're they're digging through their old junk and sending him their pencils. I mean, mm-hmm. and he's got a he's got a good thing. He's he's got a good thing going, and uh, uh, yeah, but he, you know, and and in in doing his pencil work. You know, you can see the way that he handles it and applies the graphite. Uh, the softness of the pencil makes a big difference for him, and they just don't make them the way they used to. Yeah, for sure. It's kind of, it's kind of sad, especially when you see a you know Ed, who's who's he's put the miles down on those things, and and you know, uh, it, it, it hurts actually. <laughs> mm-hmm. yeah. it's, I would like it's to, not uh, just it's not just your world, Tom, and my world. I'm a I'm a pinstriping lettering guy. That's what I've yeah. done forever and ever. And uh, the brushes have gone bye bye. My favorite pinstriping brush no longer exists. My favorite lettering brush no longer exists. So uh, well, I had to change paints. over and and the paint. Yeah, they they yeah. took the you know one shot had a lot of lead in it. That's what made it last and made it actually do what it did in it. And they took that out back in the late eighties and. I mean, I don't know who was licking it, so it's not like it really mattered. But uh, <laughs> sorry. You know. yeah. Well, they took it out um, <laughs> of their own accord, um, I'm told, and to to uh, you know to uh, to stop any any future you know problems. But then they, but then they, you know, the 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 uh, the uh, problems with with the paint not drying and the paint not covering started up. So yeah, so. It, it all it all goes all the way, and then, and then in California, you know, now you have all this compliance stuff. So you know, thinners and everything. Nothing is. It's like using mineral spirits. It's, you can't even you can't even use California mineral spirits anymore because it's just terrible stuff. So we're we're all in the same boat. You are. It's just oh, yes. Yeah. It's, it's we have a problem out here in Arizona. They no longer make the old fifty dollar bills. Um, that I used to like a lot. I'd like it if any of our <laughs> listeners could send me ones that yeah, all fifty dollar bill. There you go. Sitting around, <laughs> thought it was worth a shot. Nice. <laughs> I do have I do have a business proposition though. Speaking of all this stuff, um, what if I knew someone who perhaps their great grandmother used to cut Gustav Klimt's hair, and what if we started offering like Klimt uh, brushes? Um, just saying, um, somebody might have kept this a baggie full of. It's kind of like your used and... food idea. Yeah, this is perfect. There, Brian. This is... I, I'm I'm three for three tonight. But you can continue this. <laughs> We're all going to be rich by the end. 
clipped sable brush is done. Yeah. <laughs> well, hopefully you've had fun on here, Tom. Have you had fun on here? Absolutely, guys. I've, I've had this stupid smile plastered on my face since it started. <laughs> That's good. Been, yeah. Well, I can't say thank you enough. Oh, I, yeah. You know, it, it's more than just a pleasure to have you here. This is um, this is spectacular for us. Oh, yeah, I, enjoy, honor. I enjoyed your, your questions. They weren't of the... Uh, the standard, you know, what's your favorite color? You know, <laughs> so it's like, oh, what's your favorite color? Usually, tan line is one of my favorites, or uh, you know, goose, goose turd green. Oh, I like plaid. <laughs> plaid is a great one, that especially was... if you can do the ultraviolet plaid. Is a nice <laughs> one. <laughs> really nice. Off plaid. <laughs> <laughs> that was good. <laughs> Thanks again for listening. And if you've enjoyed this episode, please head over to iTunes and feel free to subscribe, rate, and review our podcast if you would. Also, be sure to keep in touch with us on our website at www.round6pod.com.